people coming in, Jennifer, but if you want to get started, go for it. Okay. Well, great. Welcome, everybody, this evening. Thank you for, for joining us. I believe this is our fourth social hour we have hosted to keep everybody engaged during these unprecedented times. It's super hard to uh, stay engaged when we can't see each other in person. So this is our next best thing is to, to zoom ourselves out to everybody. So um, we sure appreciate everybody joining us and taking the time to stay engaged with us. And we're super excited to see, there's several new names I'm seeing on the uh, attendee list. So that's really awesome. And of course we've got several who are returnees. So we really appreciate that. So this evening, uh, we are gonna be talking about some topics that you guys had pointed out to us that you wanted to learn more about during our last social hour. And that was talking about uh, clothing and gear. And then we're going to switch directions to uh, game calling techniques and just some basics of game calling and, and types of calls that are available to you. So that'll be uh, later on. Oh, thank you. <laughs> just a second here. You guys are probably just seeing my profile picture and not actually me. So I apologize for that. <laughs> well, here I am. Um, and then for those of you who are new to our social hour, um, my name is Jennifer Morgan. I'm the Hunter Education Coordinator for the Department of Game and Fish. Um, and so I'd like for the rest of our team to go ahead and introduce themselves. And then we'll, I'll turn it over to Tristana and she'll, she'll start us off with some slides. Cool. Go ahead, Megan. I'll let you start with introductions. Okay. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, my name is Megan Otero. I'm the Assistant Coordinator for Hunter Education and uh, glad you all could come this evening. And if you're just coming for the first time, welcome and those returning. Uh, glad, to, glad to have you guys join us again. Well, thanks. Okay, Jess, where are you? Hi, Jessica Fisher here. Um, I'm the shooting program coordinator with the department and it's great to see all of you. I wish we could see your faces, but it's just glad to know that you're here joining us. Um, <laughs> it always feels like we're talking to ourselves, but I know you're out there listening and we're happy you're joining us. So um, I'll turn it over to Tristana. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. Give me just a second. Possibly. There we go. Can everybody see my screen now? Yes. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna just start off a little bit here. Um, I'm Tristana Bickford. I'm the department's communications director. Um, so I get to do a lot of talking and I'm gonna do some fun programs like this. But I get to talk tonight a little bit about clothing, but backing up before I get into clothing, I want you guys to kind of think about your earliest childhood memory about about being outside, about, about being in nature. How old were you? Were you warm or cold? And then I want you to develop a, um, a headline, like a newspaper headline, and throw it in the chat so that we can, we can see what your, your headline would be about your first memory from your outdoor experience. Hey, Tristan, I just mean yeah. that, but um, I think your presentation view is showing the notes. Awesome. For some weird reason. <laughs> Yeah. Let's try again. <laughs> so it was kind of sp split up a little bit. That's fine. Give me one second and I'll try this again. There we go. Okay. Cool. So go ahead and feel free while we're sorting this out and throw in the chat your, your headline. Everyone's like, I'm not putting together headlines. <laughs> Who's the brave soul out there? Yeah. <laughs> ah, there's awesome. Small child barely survives fall into deadly cactus. That's that's a, that's a great one, Nikki. <laughs> Okay, so if you're having problems um, on the two, um, just select 
uh, what it says all panelists and attendees or, or and you should have a, a drop down box that pops up and then you should be able to select all panelists and attendees. If you guys are having problems with that in the chat. Cool. Helen, moving from Alaska and camping in the Eagle River campground for the summer. That's a long camp out. That's awesome. So I falls asleep why tail deer hunting. I don't know. So I love getting headlines like this because I, I mean that's what I do is read headlines and draft headlines and I feel like I'm never creative and so when I see great ones I always have to read that article but um, so when I think back to my earliest childhood memory my headline is if it'll possibly my computer is anti-work tonight there's my headline the bear is going to eat my grandpa um, I was probably four three or four and it was about um, the, the earliest thing I can remember is being out there and I was out in the mountains with my grandparents and this cute little bear walked up not that bear because I was way too young to get a picture um, but this bear walked out and he was a couple hundred yards away and walked on a log and I was like oh how cute and this has stuck in my head because obviously the bear was gonna eat my grandpa I was convinced I was yelling and screaming and the bear just sat there and watched me which was great but it was a warm day and a picnic and it was just it was really nice other than this this bear which should have been a cool thing um but when i go back to my earliest hunting memories my 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 headline changes a little bit um and it's i don't like being cold and with a gazillion exclamation points because it's true i don't like being cold i have a heating pad sitting here on my lap tonight because i i just really don't like being cold to this day um and so to go back to my early childhood hunting experiences, um, my parents had this old horse trailer that was similar to this, but it's like an orangish color now. And they closed in the whole front end, this whole area, and they insulated it so it would be warm for us to go camping in. And so when I, when I was hunting and camping with my dad, I would get up in the morning and he would turn the lantern on and he would heat up this whole area that was insulated. And then he would make me a cup of hot chocolate, um, which, it was basically two packets of hot chocolate and lots of marshmallows and I would sit there and drink it and I was happy. And then we would get in the old truck and we would go drive the roads until it was warm enough that I decided I wanted to get out of the truck and go do something. And in all of his patients um, is, <laughs> is amazing, but um, he had the patience to do that with me and drive me around until it was nice and warm. And I would, then I was happy to go for, uh, for a hike and, and go, go hunting without just driving the roads and looking for animals. Um, and so it was, it was a really interesting growing up that way. And um, thank goodness my dad took care of me because I probably was not strong enough to want to continue doing it if I was always cold. And um, so today I kind of look back and I'm like, you know, more importantly than the weather defining my, my, um, my headline is that I want to be able to defend it. I want to, I want to define what my headline is. So what is my headline now? And I want you guys to all think about what you want your headline to be. And for the life of me, I spent like a week trying to think like, I have a, an elk hunt coming up next month. And what do I want that headline to say at the end of my hunt? And I, um, I, I don't know what it is. So I did some Googling and I found some word plays and a lot of these words kind of stick with me and I'm like, yeah, it's a lifestyle, it's an activity, it's nature. I love all of that, but it's not my headline. And again, here, a lot of this is relative and I, I can understand a lot of it, but it's, but it's not my headline. And so I started thinking, what is my headline and how am I going to determine what that's going to look like as, as I continue as a hunter? And I decided that it wasn't going to be defined by the weather. And I was going to be able to go recreate and go hunting and um, be outside in the winter and not look like this poor little kid that if I dressed like that, I'd fall flat on my face trying to make it out of the parking lot, let alone actually carrying a rifle in my pack and everything. Um, and I didn't want this to be the picture that goes along with my headline. So I, I don't want to be frozen. I want, I want to be warm and comfortable. And I want that to drive my, my headline, not the weather. So the number one priority for me, and um, as, as I showed you, I have a heating pad on my, my lap. I want to be warm. I carry hand warmers with me all the time. I've had them last week. I had them in my pockets while I was outside in the evenings. 
Um, I just want to be warm. So for me, I want to be comfortable and I want to stay warm, as I said, and I want to do it without breaking the bank. And um, I love to go hunting. I love to be outside, but I have a whole range of things that I want to spend my money on and hunting and just warm camo clothes isn't for me. So when I go hunting, this is my typical wardrobe. And I'm going to show you a video from Colleen um, Payne here in a minute that highlights uh, maybe not the other side of it, but um, some, some camo and why it's important. But this is what my, my hunting attire is going to look like. And as you can see, I have one camo piece here. Um, all of the camo that I own was given to me at some point, um, either a pair of pants that didn't fit somebody and so they're hand-me-downs. Um, this one I got for working at the Wyoming Women's Antelope Hunt, which is one of my favorite events when I lived and worked in Wyoming and um, something that I, I truly hope I can go back and help with again someday. But this is, this is my, my attire. It's not a, a camo based. I do try to get neutral colors. Um, for those of you that know me, my number one passion is riding horses and I train horses. I train my horses throughout the entire winter. Um, and so like right now I'm preparing for the world show and I'm outside a lot. And so the clothes that I buy, I want them to be multifunctional and I want them to work for me when I go riding my horses and I want them to work for me when I go hunting and I want them to work when I go sit on the back porch and just want to be outside for a little bit. But I want my wardrobe to be versatile because of the way that my, my priorities in my life are situated. So I have over here, I have my my silk layer, which I think is absolutely incredibly important when I'm out there. It wicks the sweat away from me and keeps me dry. Um, I have a t-shirt because if you did any antelope hunting in August, you know it was hot. And so I want some layers. Um, this one's just a nice army green color. It's actually from the Wyoming Women's Antelope Hunt as well, but the, the logo is buried. Um, I have kind of my two mid layers here. I usually wear this tan shirt with the camo over it. And then a good vest, and, and I have so many vests in my wardrobe, um, but this one, this Carhartt vest down here is the one I wear all the time. <laughs> um, I've had it for probably 10 years, and I it's my favorite, whether I'm riding or hunting. It's not a great color for hunting, but the fit and the comfort that I get from it is versatile and warm, and so I'm willing to make concessions, and I'll put that on with like my camel pullover over it or something like that. Um, I do have this green one here to help a little bit if it's if it's a little bit warmer and I don't need the the length that's in my Carhartt vest, I'll wear this one so that it just it just fits the atmosphere a little bit. Um, and then I'm also big on hand-me-down clothes. And so my my down jacket, which as you guys can see in that picture, is absolutely atrocious. Um, it is incredibly warm. That jacket I think is older than I am. Um, it was my dad's, and I just I put it on and if you've ever had a, a good true down jacket, it's just warm and snuggly and, and, and just comfortable in it. And so, so that is with me all the time. And then the other good thing about down is that it kind of rolls up nice and tight. So it's not a big bulky jacket hanging over. Um, it's definitely not the most ideal. It makes a lot of noise. If, you, if a tree scratches me or something, it kind of swooshes against the tree. Um, but again, my number one priority is, is being warm so that I can create that headline that I want. And then I have my, um, my bird vest here, which is also a hand-me-down. I believe that was also my dad's jacket or dad's vest, but, um, it's, if you can see the pocket, it has blood stains on it and, um, shell holders that are completely worn out, but it works for the purpose that I need it to. And what I wanted to, to show everybody in this is that, if you if you want to to broaden your hunting apparel um start easy start with what you have if you if you're a soccer mom or a t-ball mom you probably have some warm clothes in there for over the winter and so start with what you already have in the closet and if you are planning on going out and getting something try and get something that's going to be cross-functional so that it will work when you're out hunting and get those kind of neutral colors but also think about something that you can you can wear to the wear to the soccer game in the spring when when it gets cold or if you want a rain jacket make sure you get something that that works for dual purposes and you don't have to have a, a, a whole hunting wardrobe that that'll break the bank um I was listening to a podcast a couple of days ago and someone made the comment that, that a, a woman that was on this trip had over $700 in camo, which is 
super awesome and good for her. Um, but it doesn't fit me and my goals and my lifestyle. And so this is the approach that I've taken. And um, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll get there, Jessica. Um, but keep this in mind and make sure you have it for, for everything. So your top and your bottom. Um, I always have at least one beanie with me and usually two gloves, hand warmers, and my wool socks, um, I, I have a pair of Carhartt wool socks and I absolutely love them. So I almost always have a pair of wool socks on me and a pair of wool Carhartt socks in my pack. That way if my feet get cold, I can trade them out and add some new toe warmers in there. Um, so what I wanted to, to just, I just wanted to put this out there and um, remember to look at items you already have. Um, hit some Goodwill stores. I have a friend in, in Northern Colorado that goes to um, the Goodwill Center um, outside of, um, i trying to think of the name, just outside of Denver in one of those small communities. And she would go to the Goodwill and, and collect um, ski clothes that were of, of neutral colors. And they were cheaper because they were a Goodwill, but good quality because people up in like the Breckenridge area can afford that. And she would use that for her hunting clothes. So, so make sure, start easy. You can go to Cabela's, Bass Pro Shop. They kind of have some good lines. Um, but then I wanted to share a video with you with Colleen. And Colleen has a camo wardrobe that um, I don't think I've ever even had that much camo on. So, <laughs> so she definitely has the camo game down a little bit more. But um, please feel free. I'm going to put her video on here in just a minute. I'm going to stop the screen sharing and start on that screen. Um, and let us know what works for you. And uh, if you have any questions, throw them in there as well. And as soon as Colleen's video is over, we will jump back in and start answering some more questions. Hey ladies, this is Colleen Payne with Wielder Foundation and our Dose program. And uh, I am so sorry I can't be there for our ladies hour today. As you are watching this, I am sitting on the mountain getting ready for a big horn sheep hunt that starts tomorrow. So um, I took the time this weekend to film this little video for you because I'm doing the last minute touches of putting all of my gear together and seeing the topic this week was clothing. Um, I thought this was a perfect opportunity to at least show you some of the stuff that I'm packing for and getting ready um, as we get ready for this hunt next week. Um, so the first thing that I always look at when I'm going to be packing for an upcoming hunt is the time of year in which that hunt's going to be taking place and the weather that's going to be predicted during that time. Keyword predicted. Um, always, always be prepared for the unexpected. Um, as you saw last week, we had unexpected way early snow showers um, and rain across the entire state. So, um, a lot of the hunters that were already out in the field going through 100 degree temperatures on their hunts saw a big change in weather. So just always be prepared for unexpected weather patterns like that. Um, and it's always good to have more clothes than are not enough. You know, us girls, we like to pack a lot of clothes. Um, so I tend to always take more than what I need and then that way I can be comfortable if I want to change out some dirty clothes into some clean ones, knowing that I have enough for my hunt. So, September hunts are always super volatile. Um, as you saw last week with this big snowstorm that came in, that stuff that's just unexpected. But September is also the peak of our monsoon season. So a lot of rain, a lot of afternoon thunderstorms are gonna occur across the state, um, especially in those mountainous areas. And so that's just something that you wanna be prepared for. So I take gear in September from everything from 100 degree temperatures to the 20s. Um, I'm a desert rat. I'm kind of a weenie when it comes to the cold anyways. So I like to pack some warm gear. I like to be comfortable. Um, you and I know that you would want to be comfortable when you're out there. So having that extra preparation and extra layer is okay. And especially if you're looking for an excuse to get some more gear, um, you can always tell your, your spouse, uh, boyfriend, Dad, whoever, hey, if you want me to go out with you more, I need to be more comfortable. I need um, some warmer <laughs> gear, more comfortable gear so that I can stay out there longer and enjoy it. Um, I am not a fan of being cold. Um, so having all of the little bells and whistles really helps me to enjoy my time while I'm out there too. So um, majority of the September months are going to see warmer temperatures, but it's always good to layer no matter what your hunt is. 
So having a base layer, a medium layer, an insulated layer, and an outer shell um, is always helpful. Uh, again, personal preference and whatever your um, body enjoys most to just be ready and prepared for. Um, some of those cool mornings, you're going to be really tempted to want to have your jacket on before you start that morning hike. Um, but soon after you start hiking, your body temperature is going to increase. You're going to want to shed those layers. So at least having something that you can keep in your pack or put into your pack is always nice too. So weight is also a factor, but also totally depends on the type of hunting that you're doing. If you're going to be doing a lot of hiking, you're going to be able to want to have some of those uh, layers that you can mix and match throughout the day when you stop and when you start hiking again, versus if you're doing tree stand or blind hunting, um, you're not going to be doing as much movement, creating Um, but to start, we'll start with um, pants. So I always carry a pair of insulated um, leggings. These are Under Armour um, base layer leggings. The, um, there's Um, I have a little bit of everything and there are so many different brands and gear and fits and functions out there. Um, it's okay to dabble around and see what fits you best and, and what performs best for you. I've tried out lots of different brands and, and lines of clothing and start to kind of piece together what I like best depending on the hunt. This hunt that I'm preparing for is an archery hunt, so having clothing that is quiet is very, very, very important to me. Um, fit, function, and quiet are big components when I'm looking for my archery gear. So, um, like I said, there's lots of different brands out there that have various price ranges. So you're gonna see a, a lot of um, different pieces that can range anywhere from $20 to five and six hundred dollars um, really depends on the quality of gear what you need it for how much you're going to be using it um, and the comfort level that you're searching for also so I'll, I'll mention some of the brands that i have here too that might help you you can do some research when you're looking to restock your closet and always keep an eye out for sales also was how i got a lot of this stuff um, so these are pair of qu tiburon pants um, they're very very lightweight very thin, they've got side vents along the side, so it'll help kind of keep you cool. Um, and the patterning on here also helps with ventilation and drawing a lot of that moisture and sweat away from your body, trying to pull your body back down. So I always like to carry um, a nice lightweight pair of pants. Um, there isn't anything too fancy to these as far as you know additional features, as I'll show you some of the other ones, but. Um, the breathability is probably the number one feature and why I love these pants so much. And they're super light. You're not wearing big, heavy pants um, that kind of drag you down. Um, so that's kind of my warmer season. Then I've got some mid to warmer season, I mean, mid to cooler season pants also that I can layer with my leggings. Um, so these are a pair of Sitka Timberline pants. And they're a little heavier weight. They've got a little warmer lining throughout the inside. They're a little heavier pant, um, but the reinforcement across the butt and on the knees is fantastic, especially for us bow hunters because we do a lot of sitting, a lot of crawling, a lot of kneeling. Um, so it helps to have that extra reinforcement. These are the men's pants, um, as well as the Q. Um, you've got really deep pockets. Um, side pockets as well and what I love most about these pants is that you can insert an additional knee pad or foam knee pad inside of here um, just go up the inside and you can put those knee pads in there and they are a lifesaver um, I've got really bad knees so being able to have that little cushion and support if I do have to crawl or kneel for shots is really handy for me um, 
Sitka also makes a women's line, so there is some women's gear available through them, um, and they make fantastic stuff as well. This is another pair of QU pants. These are more of my cold season gear pants. Um, they are the guide pants, and they are very fleece lined, uh, very, very warm. They've got the side vent on here also, so even if it's cold out and you're hiking and exerting more energy and heat, you're going to be sweating, and so you're going to want to try to cool off, um, not get overheated, not get super wet, and then end up stopping for a while and get cold. Um, that's where things kind of get dangerous as far as hypothermia is concerned. So um, having clothes that breathe is really important. So these also have side pockets, um, front pockets as well. No knee pads on these ones, but they do make some that um, you can put knee pads in. Love these pants, um, especially during those colder season hunts, but um, even these early season ones, I tend to pack a warmer pair of pants just in case, like that snowstorm that hit. I would have loved to have these if I was those guys right now. So, um, so those are pants. There's lots of different styles, brands, fits. Um, find something that works best for you. A lot of these companies you can order from, try them on, return them if they don't work and fit for you. So lots of, um, a lot of the different companies too also do their lines by season, by fabric type. So if you're looking for just early season, mid season or late season, you can filter out and look for gear specifically made for those different um, temperatures during those times. So going to tops for this hunt, I'm kind of bringing a variety. I bring a ton of shirts because I like to change every day. Um, at least feel clean. <laughs> um, but I always like to start with a lightweight base shirt um, that I can wear um, under other layers. So on this one too, not just cold and rain that we're going to be dealing with, with the, with the warmer temperatures and the sun is also um, a factor. It can really drain and wear you out. So having something that's lightweight Long sleeved, um, and a lot of these fabrics too now come with UV protection. So that kind of helps you from the sun as well. And I love having a hood, especially when it's hot because I can bring it up, get the sun off of my head and kind of away from my face. Um, if I'm sitting, you know, over water or if I'm stalking an animal, really, really helps on keeping that sun away. Um, so some of these other items that I'll show you now too are, um, this is a uh, women's line specifically made for women. Um, they've got some new camo patterns and such out too. Some really great gear. The fly going around my house. Sorry, it's been a hot mess around here. Um, they don't make this shirt anymore, unfortunately, but this just kind of gives you an idea of something lightweight that you can um, look for and layer with. I, I always just put this straight onto my skin. Um, I can wear that either alone or I'll pair it up with another shirt or vest too. Um, this is another one that's similar to it, also by ProS in camo um, with a hood as well. And then a little warmer, thicker shirt, also by ProS. This is their new camo pattern. This pattern is specifically for women also. Um, this is made by Veil Camo, specifically for ProS. So sorry guys. Uh, we finally have our own camel pattern just for women, but this is a little thicker, heavier weight shirt, um, kind of a mid-weight base, uh, mid-weight shirt and half zip. And it's kind of got some warmer lining in there as well. Super comfortable. I like the stretch to it. Um, because I'm a bow hunter, I'm always looking for something that has give and isn't really tight and restricting. So that's kind of a cap on shirts. Again, I can start with something light. I can put something a little heavier over top. Um, this is um, something kind of in the middle between a jacket and um, a shirt. This is from QU. It's a full zip. I think this is the Peloton full zip shirt um, in their very uh, pattern. It has pockets, full zip, a little heavier weight, um, but even when it's not cold enough for a heavyweight jacket, this is something um, that you can layer with and, and also something that you can throw in your pack because it's super lightweight as well. If you're going to be doing some sitting throughout the day and want some layers, something that you can put in your pack as well. On top of that, if it's getting into my cold season, 
And for this hunt too, I always like to take something that's a little insulated. Um, I get cold really easy, so it's nice for me to have something um, warm that I can put on quickly and that will warm me up quickly. So this is um, a vest from Croes that is insulated with boost down. Um, super warm, super comfortable, extremely lightweight. And even though you can see it looks kind of big and bulky, for it being um, down, it compacts really, really well and really small. I can put this into a stuff sack and stuff it into its own pocket and put it in my pack and I know it's um, safe. With insulated layers like this um, and uh, jackets also, which here is a, a cross jacket, um, these also stuff down really, really small. You want to look for stuff that um, is moisture wicking, doesn't smell, um, and is lightweight. But the important thing is you don't want to get this wet. If it rains on you, you're going to want to put rain gear over this, um, not wear your insulated layer out in the rain. Um, and you're not going to want to wear this while you're walking because it gets really, really, really warm, as well as you don't want to. Um, bump into any brush or anything to snag this and rip it open and then you're going to have a trail of feathers everywhere. Um, so be very, very gentle with your insulated layers just because they're, they're kind of sensitive. <laughs> um, but this is kind of material and comfort that you're going to want to keep close with you. Um, keep in your pack that you can layer on. I always like carrying my vest in my pack because if we get stopped somewhere, we're going to be sitting water or sitting a blind or even when we get back to camp. I can put on that insulated vest layer, warm up really quickly. Whenever we're going to hike again, I can take it back off and put it on my pack. Um, so your outer shell, your outer layer is going to want something that's a little bit more tough and durable material. Um, a little thicker, this is the Proist um, jacket. Um, very, very warm, soft material. Um, what I like about these jackets too is that they have um, a pit vent, so even if it is super cold and you're hiking and walking around, you can open these up and get some breathability out of your core, pull some of that heat away from you. Um, I've hiked several times in this jacket too, and those pit vents have saved me. Um, so super good jacket. It's got a little bit more durable fabric on the outside, so if you are walking through brush and trees, you don't have to worry about snagging or tearing it like you do with the insulated layers. Um, they're, they're very, very durable material, um, and that's kind of the point of having that outer shell is that it's your protective layer. Kind of think of it as a, an M&M. Um, the other layers, outer, outer, outer layers, and this is gear I always carry in my pack in September, no matter what, is rain gear. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, for as much as it rains in September, no matter where you're at, I like staying dry. I like keeping my gear dry. Um, if it's a quick shower, which most of the time it is, it doesn't last very long, I can take it out of my pack, put it on, sit out the shower, get some shelter if we need to, um, and then when it's over, I can take it off, shake off the rain, put it back in my pack. So this is, um, and lots of different companies carry rain gear. And there's lots of different levels of rain gear quality as well. Um, something that's very moisture wicking, you're going to want to put water on this and see it run off. Um, and depending on how much time you're going to be spending out in the mountains um, during those wet times of year, we'll be able to help you justify what type of rain gear you're going to be buying. If you're not a September hunter, I wouldn't worry about rain gear as much, but it's always good to have a layer. Um, and get it, the, my pro tip for you is get it a size bigger than you would your shirts or vests. Um, because if you're wearing all of this other clothes, you're going to want this to fit over everything. Really good quality gear. Um, I bought this whenever I went to Kodiak, thinking that it was going to rain on us the entire time. I'm glad that I took it. It did rain on us, but not nearly as much as we did, and I was dry the whole time. So. Thankful for good rain gear. The other cool kind of hidden feature about rain gear is that if it's really, really windy, 
And I don't know about you guys, I can stand the cold and I can do the wind, but when it's cold and windy, man, I am miserable. So if I know it's going to be a windy hunt or we're going to be in an area that's windy, I take my rain gear, even if it's not going to rain, because I can put this over all my other layers and it cuts that wind out. And it is a lifesaver. Sorry, we've got our co-host here. <laughs> We've got construction going on next door, so they're fun and banging around. Um, pants, also, um, most of the rain gear will come with a full zip down the legs that help you get it on and off much easier, um, and a button snap kind of there on the top. These are designs that if you needed to hike around in them as well, you can. Um, you're not just proceeding, you can certainly hike around in them. Just be forewarned, you are going to get warm, you're going to get hot. Um, with these because they don't breathe. They are intended to keep you dry and keep moisture out. Um, next thing I'll mention, so we went almost from head to toe. Um, let's talk about toes. Is a fantastic pair of boots. Um, for all the years that I've been hunting, the biggest thing that I learned was to take care of my feet, um, no matter what. Having comfortable feet, comfortable shoes, warm socks will help you continue your hunt because if you're not able to walk, you're not going to want to hunt and do anything. So um, my advice is take care of your feet, get a good pair of boots, invest in a good pair of boots. They're going to last you a long, long time. Um, the, the better comfort that you're at, the more you're going to be able to get out there and hit the hills. So a good pair of boots. I, I use a pair of Loas. These are women's boots, um, the Renegades. You can get them at REI. You can buy them online. Um, Great pair of boots. There's a lot of different women's boots out there. Make sure you try them on while you're at the store. Um, that way you can kind of feel them out, see how they're going to fit. Um, a lot of those stores, too, have some areas where you can walk around or walk on rocks. So you're just doing that. Um, to pair along with a good pair of boots is a good pair of socks. Wool socks are always the best option. You want to avoid cotton. Cotton socks, if you start to sweat or you get your feet wet, they're not going to dry and they're going to keep that moisture in. They're going to develop blisters. Then you're going to be really unhappy. Um, so a good pair of cotton socks will help draw that sweat and that moisture away from your foot. If you do get your feet wet, try to dry your socks as quick as possible. I always carry a dry backup pair in my pack just in case. They're light enough that it doesn't um, cost me any extra weight in my pack to do that. Um, there are a variety of different brands. You can get them at Sportsman's, at Cabela's, at REI. Um, there's lots of different brands of wool socks out there, and there's different thicknesses as well. So um, just pay attention to that when you're trying on your boots, when you go take a pair of wool socks with you. If you don't have one, they usually have some that you can try on. Um, there's different thicknesses uh, for different temperatures. A really thick sock doesn't work for me in my boots just because they're too tight, so I kind of wear a light to mid-weight sock. Um, some other things that you'll want to take with you, depending on the season of your hunt, is a beanie. Um, I always like to, to be warm, especially when I sleep. I like sleeping in a beanie. Um, or if it's really cold out, you know, I like to keep my ears covered. That's kind of my temperature gauge, is if I can keep my ears warm, I'm good. Um, a good pair of gloves, also. Both of these are Proas um, beanies and gloves. And it's hard sometimes to find gloves that fit, um, but a lot of the women's brand, uh, mm -hmm. camel brands now have gloves that fit smaller hands and are really warm and really comfortable. Um, one of the things that I have not been hunting without lately is a wild rag, um, which is a silk scarf um, that are pretty large. I can use this for a variety of things. I can use it for shade if I needed to, if it was really hot out. Um, but having something that I can wrap around, I can tie it up, um, keeps me really, really warm during those cold hunts. I love having a wild rag during cold hunts. September, I probably won't wear it that often, but I'm still going to pack it with me just in case. Since we're in the day and age of masks, there are a lot of, um, you'll see these neck gaiters that are made by pretty much everybody now. Um, but they do make some camel ones. They make great um, neck warmers. You can use them to pull your hair back, uh, use it as a beanie, use it as a face mask when you go into the convenience store. Um, 
Since they're camo, you can also use it to pull it up or over your face to kind of camouflage your face if you're bow hunting also. Um, just something to kind of hide your face and break up some of that pattern. Um, so one of the other things I always make sure to pack one or maybe even three of in my bag is a good hat. Um, it's always important to have some um, protection over your head and over your face from the sun. And even if it gets a little cool, help trap some of that heat in or retain some of that body heat. It does get really cold. Help with that head gear protection. And they always look good too. So I always throw in my Lucky Brown hat, never leave on a hat without it. And uh, always an MDF hat also. One other thing I always throw in my bag, even though I may not always use it, is a good belt um, that I can wear with my pants. After a few days, sometimes those pants tend to get a little loose in the waist. And uh, to make sure to keep those up and keep walking, I always uh, pack a belt just in case. That way I can put that on and still be comfortable and use the pants that I rock. So that wraps up most of everything that I have packed for this hunt. I've probably got a few other things, but very similar. Um, products or weight layers too. So I hope that this helps. I hope it gives you some more insight. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask, drop them in the comments below. Hopefully this stirs up some conversation. And if you guys need any help with gear planning and such like that, feel free to reach out to us at any time. Best of luck to you ladies this fall. And I can't wait to hear about all your successes. Wish me luck tomorrow. And uh, I know you guys will be there with me in spirit. Sorry, I couldn't make it, but, um, Hopefully you'll forgive me for this one. So have a good one, ladies. Thanks again. And uh, thanks for letting me put together this video for you. Have a good day. Okay. So oh. um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if that broke up for anybody. Um, it's raining at my house and my Wi-Fi connection is a little bit spotty, but we'll be happy to share Colleen's video with you. Um, thanks to everyone who threw comments in the chat box. There's been a lot of really good comments about how to stay warm um, and tips for using your gear while you practice for hunting. Um, and I know we're, we're getting tight, so please keep throwing those comments in there that you have your questions if you have any. Um, I also want to throw out that Colleen and Jessica were part of a group that started um, a, a women's group called Dove, and they have a Facebook page. So Jessica, do you mind grabbing the link and throwing that in there? It'd be a great place for us to share some tips or sales if anybody sees any bargain shopping um, that we can we can share our good finds with each other through that Facebook page, if, if nothing else. Um, so anyways, thanks and good luck, Colleen, on your hunt. I, I wish you the best of luck and um, I, hope, I hope you have a great time. So I think that's all I have on clothing, um, though I could talk about it for a lot longer. So we'll turn it over and talk about talking to animals next. So. Yeah, we'll pass it on to Jess. And let me see if I can get over to spotlight her. And uh, in the meantime, I threw up just one little tip that helps if you're going to be walking through some really um, dewy um, terrain, grass, brush, and stuff. Um, I love to wear uh, leg gaiters as well. That'll keep your lower legs dry and the top part of your, uh, your boots dry. Because as we have all definitely agreed and pinpointed, there is nothing worse than having cold, wet feet. That will make you more miserable than anything else. So, so that definitely helps. So, so Jess, are you, are you ready? I think so. I was like, Tristana asked me to do something and then I was like, it's my turn to talk. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna share my screen. Seeing that if you if you aren't you will in a second here, um, I'm not quite in the same spot Tristana is, but I got some sketchy um, internet here, so um, hopefully I'm not too broken up. Um, I'm going to do the quicker version of this uh, presentation. Um, we're going to talk about talking um, and why we do that. And so I think did I did I hit the right button there? I should just see my it's coming up. Um, so why use game calls? Um, animals are really vocal um, and especially uh, during their mating seasons and so using game calls will help you increase your odds of of a successful hunt um, or at least bringing some animals in um, a little closer uh, 
a lot of times um, you want those animals to come in closer if you're archery hunting, um, if you're shooting a shot, or if you're shooting with a shotgun, because they have a limited range on them, not quite like um, when you're hunting with your rifle when you can shoot at a greater distance. So there are um, lots and lots and lots of, and lots and lots of game calls out there. And they're commonly used for attracting ducks, geese, turkeys, and moose. Um, other wildlife species can be attracted with calls as well. And um, the reason elk isn't in there is because I stole that headline from Alaska. So elk are another one and, um, and deer as well. So there's four types of calls. There's position calls, which indicate the location of a member of the clan. So that's where you can um, use your call to see if somebody something talks back to you you can see where it is at um, because maybe it's just hidden right beyond um, there's distress calls like a squealing rabbit and those are often used for predator hunting and are often um, electronic but not always um, that hands-free call i think this is kind of an interesting picture i think that's a, a a rabbit squeal call there's also aggression calls which are commonly used by elk hunters during the rutting season. Uh, White-tailed deer, uh, black-tailed deer hunters will use uh, rattling antlers. Um, this action imitates rutting bucks fighting. Uh, moose hunters rake branches with moose scapulas to simul simulate a bull moose walking through the brush. And then there's mating calls. Um, and those are, I mean, that's pretty obvious what a mating call is. Um, spring gobblers, white-tailed deer, black-tailed deer um, use grunt calls, uh, rattling the antlers, um, grunts, uh, uh, deer a lot of times will grunt. You need to, um, I mentioned electronic calls and I don't have a picture of them up there, but you need to um, make sure you understand the rules and regulations for your area on um, the types of calls that are legal because there are some calls that can be illegal. Um, using electronic calls for waterfowl hunting, for example, um, can be illegal in some areas. So um, when to use calls. Uh, archery season, uh, waterfowl hunting, and turkey hunting are really popular times. Um, and um, if you're hunting during the mating season. So duck calls. Holy cow. Oh, so we're going to talk about three kinds of calls. We're going to talk about duck calls, turkey calls, and elk calls because those are the most popular in New Mexico. Um, this is somebody's collection of duck calls, but I think there's also some extra calls in there that are um, over here on this side. I think we've got some, and that looks like a bugle, and that looks like a turkey call. Um, the female duck is the duck that quacks, and the male duck makes a, a buzzing sound. So I'm going to, let me see, I'm going to try to um, go back to you so you can see me. And I've got my duck call here. Um, and I'm going to rest the call on my bottom lip and seal my top lip over the top of it like I'm drinking a Coke. And um, <coughs> make some noises with it. I am not a pro by any means. But when you... When you blow on your duck call, you want to say, hut, hut, hut. And then you can get a cadence going as three blind mice. So we got, <coughs> and oftentimes you'll add another quack to that to, um, to get the cadence of what a, a mallard um, duck sounds like. So um, there's a greeting call that you'll say, hey, you'll have your decoys out and you're like, we're over here. <coughs> All is good, come in and see. Thing with calling is, um, I watched a bunch of videos and there's there's some real snobs out there in the world. I've heard them myself, they'll say, oh my gosh, did you hear that guy honking on his call? He can't call. Um, don't be afraid to try it. You got. You have to learn somehow. You're, it's not gonna magically appear. Um, the one article I read said uh, this guy had spent hundreds of dollars trying to find that magic call that worked to bring in the ducks. So this call that I have comes as a set. 
with this call, which is, this is the other call. So this one is a double read. It's a great beginner call. And you should really start out with two calls in your arm, in your, in your, in your armor, this whistle and this double read. And so this whistle, this is a six in one whistle. It makes all kinds of noise. And you're supposed to be able to roll your tongue and make a trilling sound like a I cannot roll my tongue and blow on this call at the same time. And I know Tish is laughing at me right now because she's trying to teach me Spanish words. And she says, you have to roll your tongue. And I was like, mm, I don't do so well with that. So I'm going to go back to my screen here. So like I said, this is the system. These two calls, um, the Mallard Magic and the six in one. And um, there's videos on both of those. Um, they're Buck Gardner and um this little set here you can get that at sportsman's warehouse for 14.99 um but this duck collect call collection right here that's a thousand dollars worth of or plus of full of duck calls um let's see we'll go to the next the next slide for turkey calls there's several different types of turkey calls um and there's a diaphragm call and I want to show that video because um, I have two diaphragm videos, one for turkey calls, one for elk calls. Um, but what I want you to see is not to be afraid of them. And um, they're musical instruments, I, and I am not musically inclined. So we're going to see if this video will play. taking a minute. Do you have sound? No sound? No, just okay. no sound or video. It's not coming through. We can always throw it up with the rest of the other links that we have that we can provide to everybody with some yeah. instructional stuff. Plus we're getting kind of short on time. We're going to have to. Yeah, we're going to have to because I'm putting it on my computer and I don't know why my sound on my on my phone. So um, close out of that. We'll go back. So, anyways, the diaphragm call is the biggest thing is to get used to it in your mouth. And um, what they talk about a lot with is with a gag reflex. And this call, these calls here, these are the diaphragm calls. You can uh, trim on that. And that video was with um, Primos. And Primos calls they they have some lines that they print on their call to show you where to trim it. So um, that's something to, you got to, something to get used to, but there's great videos out there is, I guess, the most important thing to know. Um, we've got box calls and I got my box call here. And I'm like, I'm, I can make a turkey noise with that one. So those are, um, I think I'm not an expert and I think this is to me it was a pretty easy to get used to the other thing you can do with this call and I don't have a rubber band at home they're all at the office but you can put a rubber band on it and you do this take it and it simulates a gobbling turkey but a lot of people can make that gobbling turkey noise with their mouth they go blah, 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 blah. that wasn't a very good one blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I think Ben can do that pretty well <laughs> um there's also the, um, this is called a pots and pegs. I've also heard it called a slate call. And uh, <laughs> I just prepped this today and, um, and I'm already making noise with it. I, I don't know, I'm tone deaf, so I think it sounds pretty good. Does it sound like a turkey? So two, for the three great calls, um, turkey calls for beginners, and in addition to um, that box call and the the um, pots and pegs is this push call up here in the in the corner, and you literally just push that stick in and pull it out, and it makes a turkey sound. Um, so those are some good ones. Turkeys, uh, believe it or not, make eleven different sounds. They gobble. They spit and drum. There's a plain yelp, a tree yelp, a lost yelp, 
an assembly yelp, there's a crackle, they purr, there's a plain cluck, an alarm put, and a key, key. So there's lots of, lots and lots of noises out there you can make with the turkey calls. And um, like I said, I'm no turkey calling expert either. Um, I really recommend uh, watching some YouTube channels and we are gonna have some, um, some links at the end of this. So with elk calls, there are several different types of elk calls as well. We have again our diaphragm calls. Um, we have our grunt tubes, which um, and these ones I think you can also bugle with those. It's it's more than I can imagine. And then these are open read hand calls. And then we have the handheld call, which this is one here, and I think Jennifer is going to demonstrate that for us. And that call is a hoochie mama and it's made by Primos. Jen, you're up. Oh, Let's hear it. Okay. So I haven't been lucky enough to draw a public land elk tag in 17 years, so this does not get a whole lot of use, but I, I have taken it out of the closet a time or two when we're helping escort some youth hunters on a cow hunt. And um, basically what's really cool about this, this call is it doesn't really take a whole lot of coordination um, and it does have three different call settings. It'll have a, a mew, which is a typical cow call. It will have a, uh, an estrus or a hot cow, which is obviously during the rut, which is going on right now. And then it has a calf call. So what's really cool is this is all handheld. It's fairly affordable. And we do have a video link that we will show you. Um, but essentially it's, it's, it's a little plunger and you put your thumb over the, the air hole and if you can hopefully hear it, is I'm making just a basic mew call and I can put my hand over the actual um, piece where the air is coming out to make it not sound quite so crisp. Um, you know, obviously elk like to hide in the timber. And so you can, um, you can do directional with this too. And so I'm, I am horrible at a, um, a diaphragm call. It doesn't matter how much I try I just am terrible at it. And I would probably scare the elk away um, more than actually have them get curious and come to me. So I really like this. It's called a Hoochie Mama call. And again, it's by Primos. That's what they call it. And I, it is very effective. Um, a lot of the times, especially if you're wanting an animal to just stop so you can get a shot, um, an ethical shot at the animal, you can put a little mew on to have that animal stop or they'll stop and get curious enough. And that will get you just enough time sometimes to have the animal stop so you can get ready for that shot. Um, so it, it, there's so many different calls out there. You just kind of got to find one and play with it and get proficient. And it's like Jessica said, uh, sometimes it can be uh, a musical instrument. And just like with anything else, you can't be a good piano player or a good um, violin player or anything unless you practice. And so to be able to call in an animal and mimic what their sound is and to communicate with them to have them come to you um if you guys haven't had a, an experience like that it's it's that's part of the hunting experience and and that's why i think we all enjoy being outside and hunting that's i know that for myself that is is that just being out there and being putting in the homework and and, and learning these new skills and then actually being able to duplicate that to, to make that animal think you're another animal is super rewarding. It's super exciting. Um, and having an, an, an animal come to you, whether it's a turkey or a coyote or a huge bull elk, it's super exhilarating. And I, I can't explain it enough. If you haven't had a chance to do that, um, I highly recommend it. So sorry, Jess, I got a little long-winded on that one. Um, one, can I well, say one more thing too? Because I, I know you've just base, barely ta uh, touched base on the elk calls, but um, I think we did have some ladies that might have a deer hunt in the rut, which would be an archery hunt in January. Um, I, I have a little handheld call here and it sounds like a, a, a bleat. So let me see if I can get it to work. So it sounds kind of like a, a, a doe in estrus. And again, that will be just enough 
to, to get a, a buck curious whether you're hunting whitetail or mule deer and um, can also help out to your advantage. And again, it's, it's just a handheld call and it's super easy to use. So it's not in any of the pictures, but when we get back on, on screen before we um, exit for the evening, I'll, I'll show a picture of it to you. Oh yeah, there it is, the can call. Thank you, Jess. Problem. I was like, I had to talk about those too. So um, yeah, there's that can call and Jen had one handy to show you how it works and, and the noise it makes. So those are the different types of calls. Um, I'm going to go back down to that last slide. Um, so we put together a, a plethora of videos to watch and the, uh, the uh, Primo's videos aren't on this link, but I noticed just that I shared one in um, in the chat, uh, Primos has some great, um, great uh, videos, very step-by-step -step on how to work the diaphragm call. Um, Christy Titus is uh, amazing with a, with a cow call and um, she, there's quite a few vid videos of hers up here um, and with the turkey calls as well. So um, if, if you, you know, it's listening to those notes and, and mimicking them. That's the most important thing. So getting out in the woods and listening and, um, and talking to the critters is, it's super, it's super fun. Like Jen said, um, my dad and I were chased by a cow elk one time and she was just madder than, than I'll get out that we were in her space and she was stomping and grunting and spitting and all kinds of things. And so just having that experience is, is it's amazing. So um, even if you're not gonna go out hunting, if you can get out during the run, try not to ruin somebody else's hunt though, um, and, and get out there. But stand in your backyard and blow on your duck call. Um, this is my favorite duck call. It doesn't, it doesn't sound very ducky anymore though. <laughs> All right, so the, <laughs> I'll stop my screen share. Um, do we got? Do we have some questions we need to answer? I haven't seen too many come in on the on the chat. Uh, if any of you ladies do have any questions, throw them up on the chat, or you can also say say your name. And if you'd like to be, I, can we unmute people, Tristana? Are we? Do we have the capabilities of unmuting people? I believe we do. I think you can, Jen. You have host right now. Okay. So if anybody does um, have some complicated type questions that you'd like to ask, um, throw your name in the chat so I know who you are. I can unmute you. Um, we'd love to hear from you, um, especially if you guys have any comments or maybe you have a, a, a cool calling story that you would like to share with us this evening because we've got quite a few attendees with us today, especially some newbies. So um, if you would like to add something to the conversation, um, we'd love to hear from you and I can unmute you. And we're definitely hoping that we're providing you, a, it seems like a ton of information this evening, um, which uh, is good. Um, we don't wanna overwhelm you, but um, we want you guys to kind of find the path of uh, what, what's gonna work for you, what call is gonna work for you. Um, there's so many different read calls that Jessica threw out there as well. Um, some of them work really well, and then, you know, it just depends upon you as well. So, um, Hey, Jen, will, will you take the spotlight off me, yeah. <laughs> please? Everybody so can see you. Your picture and not me. <laughs> <laughs> to use two different devices to participate on some of these things. There's a lot going on. Okay, I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. Anyway. <laughs> you can just talk away and I'll move my lips differently than what you're saying. Okay. Or I'll just get my duck call back out. The dough in my picture can interpret for me. Um, but um, anyway, uh, there's just so many different um, calls available to you guys out, out there that depending upon what your interests are. Um, and for those of you ladies who have expressed to us that, hey, I'm I'm just now getting into elk hunting or just now getting into turkey hunting. Um, fall turkey's coming up also, so you've got plenty of time to, to practice. Uh, turkeys aren't as vocal in the fall, but you can still do some locator uh, calls just to see where they're at. Um, of course, we're right in the middle of, um, of elk season. So 
Um, so anyway, there's just there's just so many of out there that are available to you. And um, then with Colleen, um, wonderful video. I appreciate her taking the time to, to, to do that for us that she could be here in person. Um, gear can be a little overwhelming as well, but we do want you all to know that you do not have to break the bank. Try to find things that are, are versatile. The more you get into hunting, it's just like anything else. Um, when you get really into something, then you can start um, narrowing down your clothing selection, or maybe you have a preference, you can start building your wardrobe, so to speak. Um, and, and, but if you're just now getting into it, find things that are, are multi-purpose, multi-functional, um, find things that you can put over your base layers. Uh, and then you can just, like I said, start building your wardrobe to fit your needs and your interests. Um, and depending upon what what tags you're you're going to be uh, drawing or, or purchasing that year. So I don't want to get too long winded. Um, I think there are some hey. coming up in the chat. So I'd like to address those if we can. While we're while we're talking, um, we would love for you to throw out topics for our next um, our next social hour too, which we have scheduled for October 20th. So throw those in the chat if you've got things that we want to talk about. Um, and Jen, did you want to um, say anything about winter fishing? Oh, sure. That's great. So <laughs> folks think of, of uh, you only fish in the summer. Um, there's some actually great fishing opportunities in the winter. Um, again, you need to think of the proper gear if you're going to be standing in in cold water it depends upon if you're fly fishing or spin spin fishing um but you definitely want if you can you don't have to get the full chest waders because they can be fairly expensive um depending um but just some some hip waders or um even if you have some of those um insulated muck boots if you're only going to maybe wade up to your ankles Anything that will keep your feet warm and dry, uh, layer up your socks quite a bit. Um, let me kind of scroll back in there to find the full question here. Um, yeah, so they, they will slow down quite a bit just because their food sources um, are not quite as available. And of course they start, the colder the temperatures are, then fish start, their metabolism start slowing down. Um, and especially if it's iced over, um, and they just start slowing down, so they're not going to be as active. So that's what makes um, wintertime fishing a little bit more challenging. Um, they, they're not going to expend a lot of energy to fish or to eat as well, um, like they would in the warmer temperatures. Um, so it can be a little tricky and challenging, especially in the streams. Um, but it, it's basically presentation sometimes. What do you, can you throw out there at them? Um, that they are going to want to eat, and if it's an easy catch, so to speak, for that fish to eat. So that's a great topic, and I would love to, to, to dive into that more next time if you guys are, are interested in some winter fishing tips. Um, that would be awesome. It looks like we're getting fishing and field dressing. Oh, awesome. Jennifer, one quick question. Um, are, during the winter, are the fish closer to the surface or deeper down? Um, typically, they're probably going to go a little bit deeper, or they're actually going to go up. Now, again, if there's ice, that's going to play a huge role into that, but they're going to, to be closer to that surface. And um, what about snagging? So snagging season, um, that's at um, let's see, at Heron, it starts in October, which is right around the corner. Um, and so definitely check the rules and regs on that, um, on that. But it can be a great opportunity to get to, um, to fish for kokanee. Uh, if you guys like salmon, it's delicious. I, it is amazing fish. So, um, so check out um, our fishing um, rules and information on snagging season and the lakes that are open for snagging season. But yeah, that's literally right around the corner as well. So that's some good fishing opportunity uh, that's going to be available super soon. It's page 17 in the fishing book. Awesome. Which I know you can't. There we go, fishing. Page 17. 
<laughs> yeah, it gets lost in your background. <laughs> I know. So um, it's looking like we've got several ladies um, throwing out there that, uh, thank you, Melissa, my husband <laughs> made that for me. I love it. It's my good luck arm too, <laughs> um, from one of my cow elk that I harvested. So, um, but it looks like a lot of folks are very much interested in some cooler season fishing tips. So that's great since that is right around the corner. Uh, field dressing and maybe some self-processing would be great because we are right in the middle of hunting season. So that's a, a super great tip. Um, scouting, uh, we did touch base on that a little bit, but if I think we do have some new, new folks available uh, or have, have joined us this evening as well. So we can always throw that in the mix. But from what I can gather from everybody's topics, and Tristana and Jess, you can kind of, um, you guys are probably monitoring that chat a little bit more since I've been yapping a little bit, but I can't, I can't, I can't multitask all the time. <laughs> um, but um, maybe, maybe the field dressing and cold season fishing tips, is that what I'm kind of seeing? Yes. Yep. Awesome. And we can probably some scouting, some additional scouting tips in there as well. So the scouting we did touch on and you can watch our previous social hours on our YouTube page. And um, if you wait just a minute, I bet Tristana is gonna have the, the link before I get done talking. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, and definitely for those of you who are very new to what we've been doing for the last, oh, what, four months now? Uh, we've been offering these opportunities and I, I appreciate very much you as, as, as a group of ladies and women helping us keep this engaging. This is you, you guys are driving, driving this boat and we appreciate it um, very, very much. Your input, your participation, um, we are here for you. We wanna make this um, time for you guys and, and be as engaging and educational as possible. So uh, we super appreciate you guys throwing your ideas out there because um, we want this to be for you. So, and I think Tristana did just put the link up to our previous um, social hours where they're posted. So you can, for those of you who might've missed and haven't been able to be on all the time with us, or you might be new to us this evening, which I do see several new names on there. So that's super awesome. Um, go out there and, and check it out and catch up. And if there's something that is out there that, you know, we didn't cover or you'd like to hear more about, maybe we can go in depth more, um, throw that out there. And Tristana, do you wanna put up all of our contact information? Cause I do notice that there's a few folks having to leave everybody gets gets our information. There you go. Can you see it? I know it's my presentation, but can you see it? Yeah. Okay. So and I, I just want to say thanks to everyone for sharing your headlines because I wish more than anything we were together and I could hear the stories, especially around a campfire, because that's one of my favorite things and something I miss the most. So thank you guys. Yes, most definitely. Um cool. oh go ahead, Jess. Did somebody have something? I'm good. I think it's time for supper. Yes, I think so. <laughs> it's Taco Tuesday, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dear Taco. <laughs> so awesome. Um, so anyway, thank you, ladies. You are amazing. I appreciate, we all appreciate your participation in these. Um, we learn actually from you all as well. So October 20th, thank you, Tristana, is our next social hour. Uh, we'll work together for um, these next topics you ladies brought to our attention. We'll work on some content. And if you do have any questions, send us emails, give us a, a call about anything. We are here for you. So we look forward to seeing everybody next month. So have a great week and good, good luck on any hunting or fishing trips you might be uh, adventuring on. So have a great evening. <laughs>